Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. I'm really excited because today my guest is Mr. Paul Woodedge. He's coming at us from France. He is a very experienced World War II podcaster, a battlefield guide, uh, brings a wealth of knowledge about a variety of topics, and I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Paul, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. So it's uh it's really exciting to have you here. As I indicated, I'm really happy to to have you on the show. And I kind of want to jump right into it by asking you kind of what it's like right now in France. The uh, I've had the opportunity to go there last year toward the Normandy battlefield. It's amazing the uh, level of preservation that folks uh, have dedicated to those sites. But I imagine that uh, COVID, the pandemic, has affected battlefield tourism and has affected how you present material to the world. So if you don't mind, if you yeah. could kind of give us some, some kind of insight into what's going on right now. Well, it has definitely. I mean, there's basically no tours. I mean, I, I had moved away from touring a little bit the last couple of years, but I would still have expected to do 80 or 90 days of touring. I've done, I think, six last year. Magma, the half, would normally do 150 tours. I think she did about 10. So, you know, we're 90% down on what we would normally be doing. But I just wanted to make the point, as you've got a you know, large American audience, one of the things I noticed back in June is when, you know, where there was the the d-day celebrations as people were saying in the states oh the, the not, that nothing's happening this year well things were still happening the french were still remembering the sites there were still ceremonies taking place just they were a lot smaller instead of it being hundreds of people gathered it was 10 people gathered but i just wanted to make the point that someone who lives here and very pro-french that don't don't be thinking that the french and indeed the belgians and the, the, the dutch didn't continue to honor their um, their anniversaries they just did it in a in a covid safe 2020s uh way but uh yeah so that the, the remembrance still continues the research keeps continuing it's just that you know there's no there's no punters here to buy to, to, to go on tours <laughs> no understood and, and the remembrance is certainly the key so that's really gratifying to hear that that was still ongoing even if there's only one or two people to remember at any given time the fact that it the, the those remembrance ceremonies still take place is really important so uh, you've indicated that you had gotten away from battle tourism in the battlefield tourism, excuse me, in the past couple of years. Was that to focus on podcasting or researching or other aspects no. of World War II? Well, um, everything I've done in my career, which uh, even giving it the word career sounds this, this, like there's been some kind of plan behind it. Everything has really happened by accident. All I felt a couple of years ago is that I was, I was still... Um, I was still guiding, but I wasn't as passionate about it as I'd been in the past. I still feel I was doing a good job. I was, my customers were, were, were satisfied with what I was telling them, but I just wasn't feeling kind of the buzz anymore. So I, I made the decision to move away from it without really knowing what I wanted to do. And I initially started to make proper sort of full-blown documentaries myself doing the proper high definition of film work at sites and then ed editing and putting things together. And I did a few of them. Um, and then I realized that that actually wasn't quite what I wanted to do. It, it, I missed, frankly, the interaction of having been a tour guide. Your audience is there with you all the time. I mean, I work now these days with historians and authors, and they're very much used to their, their audience not being in front of them. If you're a writer, you're, you know, it's a solo occupation. But as a tour guide, your audience is right there. They're there responding to you. They're asking you questions. They're saying, oh, I read this. And can you tell me what happened over there? And by doing documentaries, I was losing that connection. So that so I moved, then I moved into the, 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 the YouTube channel and the podcasting as a way of combining the, the two things I'd done in the past. But it, it really was an, accident, an accidental birth out of a COVID 19 lockdown really are there people now coming to me say oh you've what you've done uh, how did you start it and what were your what were your plans and well no there was no plans i just i just sort of leapt into it really so taking things back a few even a few years further how did you even get into battlefield tourism to begin with as to, to even have a career to evolve along this trajectory well, it's a, it's, it is a, it is a long story. I mean, essentially, I, I left school at 16, uh, didn't know what to do. Um, and 
I had been part of Veterans Association since I was a teenager and I had come to Normandy on various sort of bus tours with British veterans as coming from England and uh, enjoyed it. And what I found myself doing is in that I had read voraciously about the Normandy campaign, had all the books, is that the veterans were very good at being able to relate the story of what they had been doing with the unit they were attached to, but often didn't know the greater picture as as you would imagine the case anyone who served the military you know your bit but you don't necessarily know the other else's bits and i would listen to these conversations where they were talking about the, let's say the the battle of um charnwood the taking of Caen in normandy in 1944 and they wouldn't understand the progression of the battle and i would started explaining to them how the battle was planned which was very uncomfortable because like, i was 18, 19, telling guys who's actually been there and earned uh, military crosses and what have you and, and decorations, what they were trying to do. But, you know, that that is sort of how it started. It started accidentally. And then it got, well, Paul, Paul knows. Paul knows about that. Paul will tell you about what happened over there. And I started kind of being able to put context together for veterans. And then it sort of evolved to taking groups of friends over to Normandy. And then a long time, you know, 20 years ago now, I decided um, to, to make the, the move to France and I didn't really have a plan. That's the weird thing. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought I might get a job in a museum. I might do this. I might do that. And as with anything else that's happened to me, I kind of fell into guiding accidentally. And 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 when I started the, in Normandy, there was about maybe seven or eight tour guides, and they were doing not just World War Two stuff. They were doing cathedrals and Mont Saint Michel and things like that as well. And I was one of the first to say, I'm, no, I'm just doing Dida. I don't, or well, the Battle of Normandy. I don't, I don't do the chateau stuff. I don't do churches. I don't do that. I just want to stick on the battle. We roll forward 20 years. There's about 150 tour guides in Normandy, um, a conservative estimate. So the industry has gone for just crazy in the 20 years. And any um, reputation I have, and thank you very much for flattering me at being at the top of the show, is basically because I got involved early. It's not because I was necessarily better than anybody else. It was all about timing. And and I got in when the industry was still developing and I had a, 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 some guides who worked for me and I kind of pushed to do multi-day tours, the battlefields, and now I'm kind of one of the senior guides in Normandy. There's a few older than me, quite a f uh, but quite a lot now, a lot younger than me. So, yeah, it, it, it has changed a lot over the 20 years, but I, I didn't necessarily have a plan to, to get to where I am today. That's really interesting. Now, with the growth going from a handful to, as you said, conservatively 150, do you find that that kind of ups the quality of tours overall because you've got to stand out? Uh, or do you guys kind of work collectively to present a better, more comprehensive picture of what went on? Or is it just a more competitive field? Um. That's a really good question, and one that's sort of hard to answer without appearing to be negative about some of the other guides. What What's happened to the industry? And, and I'm talking about pre-COVID times, because COVID is obviously going to change things long term, how people visit and how people travel. But what was happening is a bit of a chicken and egg situation, is that people were coming to Normandy in greater numbers from the USA particularly and by the way 95% of the touring market in Normandy is Americans I mean a few Brits come a few Dutch but in terms of those who pay for guided tours it is predominantly Americans which is why when you weren't traveling last year our industry just you know drove off a cliff you know people have tried to get some more work from the French the Dutch the Belgians and what have you and it didn't really happen we didn't realize until last year just how dependent we were on Americans coming over. But in coming over, what's been happening is Americans with their restricted vacation time and their need and feel to kind of pack things in is there's been this desire to get the D-Day beaches done in a day or even a half day, even half day trips from Paris. People coming on the train in the morning, spending four or five hours in Normandy and going straight back to Paris in the evening. And the problem with that way of looking at the Battle of Normandy is there's not there hasn't been the associated need for the tour guides to be very good at their jobs in that what they're having to convey is so limited given the time Americans are genuinely wishing to give to the Normandy campaign. There's not been this need to develop beyond that. And I'm saying that and trying to say that in such a way to not insult my American clientele and not insult my fellow tour guides. And that's why I say it's a chicken and egg thing. And I'm not sure whether it was the guy, the guides 
the tours that were influencing how Americans visited, or whether it was the Americans wanting what they wanted that influenced how the tour companies set up their tours. I don't know how it happened, but what's interesting is, is that, that that's the way it has been done. You come for a few hours and that's it. And what I sp spent last year doing, um, so the, all through the lockdowns and what have you, is, is branching out further afield. And that connects with when you asked me about when I'd been a tour guide, even myself, one of the kind of senior tour guides, I was still spending most of my time doing the same tours again and again and again, because that's what people wanted. That's the amount of time they allocated. So it was, um, you know, 150 times a year at Point du Hoc. Whereas what I'd rather do is spend 10 days at Point du Hoc, 10 times at Point du Hoc, but then 10 days in Saint Lo, 10 days in, in Falaise Gap, 10 days in Cherbourg. But that's not the way the industry has been, been going. Um, I'd like to see a, a, a real change in the way visitors to Normandy approach the battle and that they start thinking, I can't do that in a day or two days. If I'm going to do the Battle of Normandy, a 77 day campaign that covered an area the size of, 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 of Israel, it's about, about 10,000 square miles, Normandy battlefield. I need a week to do it. And in a week, therefore, I can do the beaches and I can also do the Battle for Cherbourg and the breakout from Caen and Saint Lo. Um, and so, if and when the touring industry kicks off again, I hope maybe there will be a change and people want to spend a bit longer here and do a bit more than just the D-Day beaches. As important as the D-Day beaches were, there's a lot more that happened after June the 6th. No, certainly. And that's actually a really fascinating way to put that. You know, being an American myself and knowing our <clears throat> want it now fast food culture, I, I can certainly see how that kind of drives. Let's get 77 days crammed into a four hour tour or are you even seeing though uh since you're doing so many tours pre-covid with americans who maybe are familiar with band or brothers or saving private ryan or the longest day but aren't hardcore historians is there even an interest in the discussion of Khan, the discussion of uh taking sherborg or is it all about just the beaches and maybe some airborne stuff but nobody really wants to talk about anything past d plus three yeah well again it's a tough one to answer because people come i think without that interest but once you can ignite that interest it doesn't take long for them to show an interest it's just you've got to get them out of their comfort zone um i mean i, I would do what i would call band of brothers tours um and i would advertise it as you know following in the steps of footsteps of e company 506 and a lot of the tour would be about that but at various occasions of the tour i would branch out and i would talk about the 50 deuce attacking carrington i would talk about a company 506 up near avenaville i would talk about the other aspects and occasionally okay, people would say why aren't we talking about dick winters i said well we will do it in a few minutes but we need to get this bit in before we get to that bit because it's all about context without understanding the rest. It take Breckle Manor. Yeah, everybody knows about Breckle Manor, episode two, day of days, you know, it's, it's, it's the knocking out of a, of a gun battery. But what, you, what still continues to get on my nerves is people's, and I've read it on a line, people say, oh, that was the most important action of D-Day. No, it wasn't. It's one of many dozens of actions which combined together resulted in a victory. But you can't, claim that Brecor is anything beyond what it is. It's an important action, but so are the taking out the guns at Holdy. So is the taking out of the guns, uh, the, the garrison at San Martin de Varaville, the, uh, the, the occupying of the bridges, uh, the, uh, the seizing of Saint Marie de Mont, the, uh, the Lafayette Causeway, the, 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 the Nouvelle Plan. And, and so you've got to get people in and then kind of mess with their heads and say, okay, forget about what you, you think you know is important. Use that as a, as a stepping stone to now broaden out sideways and understand how these events fit into a greater picture. And so in a sense, I was kind of lying by saying my tours are Band of Brothers tours. They were, that was the hook. You know, it's, it's, it's like you give, you know, you, you, you sell them the roast chicken, but you give them the, the, the vegetables on the side because it's good for you. You know, you know, you know they, they come for the fries, but you make them have some salad with it at the same time, if that isn't a ridiculous analogy there. 
That was a terrific analogy, actually. That was a fantastic answer. And that like three more questions sprung up in my head as I was listening to that, right. that very detailed answer. So the the first one being, I, I'm an old 325 guy from back when I was on uh, active duty. So Lafayette Causeway kind of holds a special place in my heart. It holds a very special place in the, uh, the history of my regiment. Is there a, uh, have you found that actions like that, that just don't get as much publicity are you able to generate interest once people are there? You kind of say you mess with their heads and you give them more scope or do they still kind of want what they've seen in uh, you know, mass media or, or can you spend an afternoon at Lafayette and really explain the importance yeah. of that action? Yeah, and when I say me, I've got my colleagues, friends of mine, Colin Taylor, Duncan Hollins, who are similar age to me, mostly Brits um, who do a similar thing. If you can get them to wherever it would be, Lafayette, the Falaise Gap, Montormel, Cherbourg, once you've got them there, I've never had a failure when you've got them there. You've just got to convince them. You know what? I know you've read about this site. I mean, Point du Hoc is the example, okay? And uh, Point du Hoc, the American Battle Monuments Commission have now made the site so you can only walk through a roped off walkway the grass is high you can no longer go inside the bunkers you can no longer do half the site now that has not changed the importance of that of that mission by second return rangers there it has not lessened that site significance but as a place to visit it is now not as good as it used to be now when we start touring again i will try and convince my customers that the hour we spend shuffling around Point du Hoc in crowds might be better spent somewhere else where it's just us, which is a story you perhaps don't know, but you might end up getting more out of that hour than you would at Point du Hoc, because at the end of the day, you already know the Point du Hoc story. So I'm not gonna be giving you anything there you don't already know. And without being able to access the site in its full glory, trust me to take you somewhere else and we can do something else. I don't know what, I would suggest as an alternative, I don't know, but let's talk about the German 352nd Division pushing for the gap between Omaha and Utah and the fighting around Grand Comte Maisie, something like that, the, the, the floods there, the Marais there. Maybe that's as an important use of that hour as it is walking around Point du Hoc. But it comes to, I think, visitors to Normandy, like visitors to any battlefield, need to start trusting the advice of the tour guides. Like when I get my minivan serviced and the mechanic says you need to replace that i just say fine because i assume he knows what he's talking about i'm not going to go well i've i've been looking online and i think that it's i trust them to make those calls for me and if if i was in hire engaging a, a, a private tour guide in normandy i would say look i know i've got sites in my head that i think i perhaps should see but if you think i should see something different i'm paying you to do that because i could go and see those other sites on my own you know, that's the thing. You don't need a tour guide the American Cemetery. It's all labeled for you. You don't need a tour guide in Santa Maria Clee. It's all information boards. Have the tour guide take you to Lafayette, take you to Corkini Chapel, where the 325th uh, went across. Have them take you to the places that you, you don't know how to find. But it comes down to trust. And it comes down to people being a bit more um, uh, uh, braver in their choices when they come to, a, to, a, to somewhere like Normandy and say, okay, yeah, I, this, is a, this is important to me. And I have these places, but you know what? I'm going to let that tour guide steer me. Understood. So my follow on question is you, you get 95% of your tourism come from the United States. Do you find it's a very American centric interest when they get there? Or can you get them out to the other beaches, get them out to Pegasus Bridge, and then they want to hear more about the other uh, allies and their participation in the battle? Um, it, it is an uphill struggle, I think, to convince Americans that, that there are other countries involved. Um, and one particular thing that we joke about is that I'll be driving back my Americans, because often my, you know, my customers are mostly Americans, and they've done two or three days, and we'll be driving back into Bay Air, coming to the end of the two or three days, and and uh, it's their, their information overload, overload. And they'll be driving back in, they'll say, so we've got five minutes to go now. They'll say, okay, so um, just run through what happened on the British, British beaches for us while we're driving back. And I go, <laughs> um, 
What do you want me to say? I mean, not, not as not as badly as Omaha, better than Utah. Is that a good enough summary for you? <laughs> Point is, I say, I've just spent two days going through all the various details of how this bit linked to that bit, how that backstory there led to. I can't now do the British beaches justice in five minutes just because you've got five minutes left. You need to devote an equivalent level of time to that to understand the nuance of that as well. Um, but, you know, and you, you, you know, someone like yourself, you know, you've served, you've read a lot, you would be surprised, but I've honestly had American customers in their 40s and 50s unaware that the British were involved on D-Day. It's happened to me numerous times. And every time it happens, I kind of do this jaw open and I had to kind of shape myself. And then you realize they have learned the Saving Private Ryan version of history. They've learned the... The, the the slightly american centric and you know you know you know me you follow me on facebook i've got lots of american friends i i am a huge respect for american authors and but the world war ii magazines the world war ii you do teach a very us us centric version of world war ii um, and me living in Europe, you know, I read more about the Polish experience, the French experience, the Russian front and things as well. And I think, especially because I'm not in the country I grew up in, I'm an Englishman living in France, it makes me naturally more um, embracing of other ways of looking at things. And, you know, the, the US version of history is very interesting. And when people say to me, oh, I've got the, the box set of Stephen Ambrose, or I've got the box set of John McManus or whatever it was, I said, have you read uh, have you read British authors? Have you read Canadian authors? No. And I go, well, you should do. And it's not that John McManus is not a good author. He's a good friend of mine I, and he writes brilliantly, but he's going to give you an American point of view based on understanding American archives. Read James Holland, um, read Mike Bechtel, re read Tim Cook, read, read a, a German historian, um, and then put them together and you'll get a, a wider version of events. Um, but it's, it's, it is an uphill struggle uh, with 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 people from your side of the pond, I have to say, and I, I, I I'm I, I'm apologizing profusely to Americans watching this, but it is something we have to we have to strive uh, towards and trying to, you know, convince them that it is worth going to the British beaches. It is worth examining the, the attack on Carr and and, but it's, it's it's the preconceived ideas, you know, the sort of Americans, you know, so you're English then, so Montgomery was a bit of a twat, wasn't he? And you go, well, okay, okay, and and you have to ask them why they think montgomery is a bit of a twit and 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 i'm, I'm not a montgomery's greatest fan to be honest but and as a human being he's a bit of a dick but as 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 someone in command of 21st army group i always say okay you don't want montgomery who could do the job as well and give me a name give me someone else who could do what he was doing and invariably they say Patton. you go no and it's nothing to do with not wanting i i quite like what Patton did sometimes but he's not a guy in charge of an army group that's not his that's no, not exactly. his that's not his skill set you know it's like eisenhower i have I, eisenhower is my kind of my favorite figure of d-day but eisenhower knew what he was good at and what he wasn't good at he let that he, he was good at human dynamics and he let other people he delegated the strategy he delegated the tactics to other people and Patton is great at what Patton does but he couldn't do what montgomery could do it's 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 like anything it's like a sports team you know you're you're I'll, I'll pretend I understand American football, but your quarterbacks, your running backs, your like, they all have a different place in that team and they can't do someone else's job. And it's identifying what they do and what they do well. And, you exactly. know. Exactly. And it's absolutely and, yeah. amazing that the, those personalities were kind of put in the right places that you actually got a Montgomery in 21st Army Group and yeah. a Patton in charge of 3rd Army. Uh, the, you got a Patton uh, up against someplace like Mets and all of a sudden he's not quite as great as he is when he's breaking out of the hedgerow country, you know, because it's a different set of circumstances. And, and I think it comes back to that American centric uh, viewpoint. The reason we think Montgomery's a twat and Patton would be better is we've all watched Patton 12 times, you yeah, know, exactly. and, and that's probably our, our whole exposure to him. If you show a real photograph of General Patton, we might not recognize him. If you show us George C. Scott, then, you know, well, we're all in. The first time anyone actually hears Patton's real voice, because in your mind, when you read a Patton quote, you read it in George T. Scott's voice. I do. And then when you first hear, there's that one bit of film on YouTube of, of Patton speaking, you go, Is, have I got that on the Like when you had 78s and 33s and 45, 45 <laughs> you think, have I got the wrong speed? And you realize he, he sounded absolutely nothing like, like George T. Scott. But that is now how we perceive General Patton. And Montgomery is seen 
based on these film film portrayals, which is they're not that they're wrong. It's just that you know, I mean, the I didn't know we were going to go into the Patton Montgomery thing, but the thing is, it's interesting is that they both fulfill the national stereotypes that the other nation hates about the other nation. We yes, we so. Brits hate the loud, brash American cigar kind of, you know, coming in there, taking <laughs> over. And you hate the kind of the tweedy, fastidious little, you know, effect kind of. And Montgomery and Patton kind of represent these cliches that instantly the other nation kind of goes, oh, so we, we naturally grow up as Brits not liking Patton. You naturally grow up not liking Montgomery. And other generals who don't fulfill the same character, character, uh, uh, cliches like Dempsey and the Second Army and Bradley, I think we don't have, they don't come into those arguments because they're not cliches. Uh, you're exactly right, sir. And, and the more I grow and learn, I got to admit, Dempsey's one of my favorite generals of all time. But it, but it took me to, I was almost 40 years old before I could appreciate him because it, it takes a while to dig through the popular culture aspects yeah. of it. So I, I want to get on to talking about podcasting a little bit, but I've got one more battlefield tourism question that's grown out of this discussion. You mentioned you know, the, the contribution of the Poles, contributions of other nations. I've recently gotten very fascinated by the Polish contribution, not only first independent parachute brigade, but what was going on in Warsaw. Do you think there's ever going to be the ability to offer tours that go into, you know, let's focus on what happened at Drill. Maybe we can do some touring in Warsaw. Or do you think because it's a business as well as people's avocation, you're going to have to cater to the people who want to hear about the Saving Private Ryan version of history and maybe content yourself with growing their knowledge a little bit instead of being able to specialize in some fascinating but relatively unknown history? Well, I think, I think this is where it will have to rely on other methods beyond just visiting the battlefields. I think when people visit battlefields, they will want to stick with the stuff that's to do with their nation. So when Brits go to Arnhem, they want to go to go, going to go to Arnhem Bridge, and when Americans come to Norway, they're going to want to go to Omaha and whatever. But this is where the kind of the, the what I'm doing with my World War II TV, where you're you're doing live streams from battles. I think that is where you'll be able to convince people to go to places from their couch that they wouldn't necessarily spend money to go to on a trip. I mean, I did I did three shows last August from the Falaise Gap. So I did one from the town of Falaise about the Canadian taking of Falaise. Then I did a second one from San Lambert, so I about the Canadians down there in, in, in the middle of the pocket. And I did a third one from the Mace about the Polish there. And yeah, that they they were they were well viewed and and interesting about the Polish side of things. The last year or two, social media has been a revelation of this. There's lots more access to Polish archives by by British and American Polish expat who understand the language. Jenny Grant, I want to give a shout, shout out to those who are on Twitter, and uh, she's huge on Twitter now. And she's a you know English history teacher but her ancestry is polish and she's doing lectures now to about the polish army in world war ii and general maciek and things like that and i think her access to archives and other people like herself will mean the polish story will start spreading out beyond where it has been i mean you know my problem with my books is that there's very little written about the polish that's in the english language you can get stuff in Polish language, a little bit in French, because the Polish second language in World War II was French, but very little in English. But now with, 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 with social media and the ability to share and, and, and translate and things, I think there's a much more opportunity for, for a, a Polish study to be done in English language. So I think watch this space as far as the Poles are concerned, because I think there's only going to be more and more available to us. Oh, that's exciting. I'm really happy to hear that. And that's a fantastic segue into talking about the podcasting. So you, you, you kind of walked us through how you got involved in you know, t history as a business. You transitioned from battlefield tourism into documentaries. You kind of realized that wasn't exactly what you're looking for because you didn't have that audience interaction. So then you've hit on podcasting and you have this fantastic World War II TV podcast, this YouTube channel. What is the uh, is, is that kind of scratching the itch that you have to be able to explore various aspects of history and still interact with an audience? Do you yeah, think absolutely. you found the niche? Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's still a work in progress. I, I'm using Zoom for most of my shows so far as you are, and I eventually want to move into other things and, and other types of quality of broadcast. But yeah, that's the that's the ability. I've done live streams. So I've had the, the, the format is quite simple. I host for my for my office in France. 
I have a historian join or one or two historians join online from wherever they live. And I have for my battlefield live streams, at least one or two cameras on site doing live filming just on their phones back to me that we then talk over. So obviously I started in Normandy because that's my backyard. I had people like Alex Kershaw, John McManus, James Holland on talking about various um, uh, campaigns. But when I got the end of last year, I had done streams from Warsaw. We did one from Hong Kong. We've done two from Stalingrad so far. Um, and we, we, a couple, uh, three from the Netherlands. Uh, and I will expand as I find people around the world to do it to other locations. I want to do stuff from the Pacific and, and Guadalcanal and, and, um, and, and more in Russia and places. And it's, if I can get someone there and they have internet connection and we can get everyone together, then we can bring battlefields to people's living rooms um, with discussion by prominent historians over them. Um, and it's free. I mean, it's, it's that's the great thing. Now, of course, a, an image coming from a mobile phone via Zoom onto YouTube is not like actually standing on Omaha Beach. I mean, nothing, and you've been there yourself, there's nothing like standing there at low tide and taking everything in. But that costs you money to get to, to for Americans yes, to sure. get to Europe is expensive. And one of the things as I've got older, I've got more and more... Um, I'm going to say socialist minded, but that's a dirty word in the USA. But what I mean is, is that I've made a good living taking, paying customers to see the beaches, but to pay for a tour with me is represents only a certain level of people because they've, they're people from America who could A, afford to travel to Europe and B, afford to hire a private guide for two or three days. And I believe quality history should be available to everybody. I believe if you're a 15 year old kid sitting in Milwaukee or you're a 23 year old student in, in, in Ottawa or wherever, and you want to study World War II, you should have access to quality history just the same as wealthy people. And so that's why I'm doing my stuff free on YouTube and then hope people who, who have got money help me via Patreon, which they do. But I think there's something very wonderful about offering people virtual travel to battlefields live with with really good historians and so that's that's yeah i'm really enjoying it and it, it, it's it's working so far no that's fantastic it's almost sort of a democratization of information if you will and i think that that that's terrific and it's going to go a long way to kind of counterbalancing those stereotypes we were talking about earlier because the content's out there and all you got to do is is do the google search and or check yeah. it out on youtube which i think is terrific the uh when you reach out to these historians, are you just cold calling folks? Maybe you met somebody on a tour, you met somebody at a commemoration, or the, how are you identifying your guests and the people that help you bring these projects together? Well, it, I've, al I've always, since I began a tour, being a tour guide, I, 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 I always had this interest in reaching out to people and making connects with, au with authors. And partly it was to get them to sign a copy of my book, but also it was to make contact for future for future potential projects so right at the beginning you know i made contact with people like marty morgan out of louisiana and john mcmanus and others and so when i started the, the the youtube channel i initially just went to my little black book which was already fairly extensive and then you find that one person you know knows someone else and then they know someone else and um and and i've now got a, a little bit of a kind of a body of work behind me now that i can now cold contact people who don't know me but i just name drop a few people who i've done shows with and they, they will always recognize two or three of the names and go okay and i can give them a link to a show and i say well watch this one and i've only had um uh one person tell me that i've had a few no no responses to emails but it doesn't mean maybe my email didn't get through to them or it went into a spam folder but i've only actually had one person say no they didn't want to do it and it was because they weren't interested in talking you know, on, on screen. No one has said, no, I, you know, I don't like you piss off. No one said that to me yet. Um, so yeah, I, I've been very lucky that I had established a bit of a rapport with these people over the years and just sort of called in some favors. It was the timing of doing it during COVID. I mean, the, the, the bit I didn't say of the story is that I, the, the idea to do the live streaming came about when I realized that there was going to be nothing much going on on June the 6th last year so i decided like an idiot to do a 15 hour live stream from sitting right here and i had i sat here for 15 hours straight 
um, and had various guests come on and on. I had cameras out and there. You know, people, out, when they were out, they beamed images back as and when they could. And I had people come on and talk. And um, and uh, and it worked, you know. And I just started saying, okay, will you give me half an hour? And people like Andrew Roberts, uh, you know, Churchill's biographer, you know, he's on American TV quite a lot. You know, Andrew would normally quite rightly as a historian and well-known figure would expect to be paid for this kind of work and i just said you know i'm doing it on june city yeah sure paul i'll give you half an hour and 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 that's how it's been gone and people that that's that people have been trusting enough to say i'll give you half an hour i'll give you 45 minutes i'll give you a show and 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 as it's pushed on if i get an author on a show now they will sell a few extra books because of it and and i want it to be like with yourself that with what you're doing, I want people to look forward to coming on my show, not see it as a bind. Okay. Um, and you can tell with me, I love talking about this crap, you know, it's this, this my life and I'm not going anywhere. I'm stuck in my house on, you know, with, with mag all the time, my other half, and I'm not, I'm missing touring. I'm missing doing stuff. So someone says, do you want to come on and talk about world war two? Yeah, quite right. I'm happy to go. And it's shutting me up is the problem. And so you know, there's a particular author. I did some couple of shows with in Britain. And on one day last year, he did two or three media shows. He did one with me and one with a couple of other things. And and my other ones was with, with a big, a big, you know, radio sent radio show. And he got lots of lots more views than he would have got on mine. But I could tell in listening to hit the show with someone else that the he was being asked very generic questions by a very generic kind of BBC person who said, you know, tell me about your book. And and he was happy to do it because he was selling his book. But when he did my show, he enjoyed it because Absolutely. He understands that I understand the subject back and we can kind of go down some different paths. And, and, you know, as soon as the show was over, he said, I really enjoyed that, Paul. I really enjoyed that. And now he's kind of contacted me saying, when, when do you want to use me again? You know, and that, that's great. Uh, if you can get to the point where they're looking forward to coming on because uh, they can just chat and, and if they want to say a naughty word, they can say a naughty word. It doesn't matter. It's not like, we, you know, if they want... I've, I've not got to fit into a schedule or a time frame. And I've done history channel uh, work with history shows in the past and you get booked to be a talking head and you come on, you kind of get, given, sometimes you get given a script and you get told how to answer the questions and you're told where you've got to go with it. And that's very, very frustrating. Um, that, you know, that literally happened to me with a history channel, the, uh, the one for the 70th anniversary when they, they they booked me and they said, oh, you're going to be among all these other historians. And so I was like, we're looking forward to it. And then about a week before the interview, they sent me the answers I'm supposed to give to the questions. And you're like, that's a shame. But I thought you were going to ask me what I thought. He said, oh, yeah, but we, we kind of worked out the script. Um, And that if you're a historian or an author, you don't want to be speaking someone else's words. Certainly. You want to be speaking your own words. And the thing is, we've all got different opinions and, you know, and, and so much of history is just about opinions. And, you know, I could get five or six of us together and we could discuss, you know, pattern, for example, and we could have five different opinions about various decisions he made. None of us are right or wrong. It's just, it's just a debate, isn't it? It's like the, who was the greatest quarterback? What's the, what's the best movie you've ever seen? It's, it's entirely subjective. And that's so, interesting. The, the, yeah, the exactly. Answers are, are what people are looking for. And the greatest example of that in recent memory of your work, I absolutely loved when you had your panel together to discuss the influence of World War II on the Star Wars universe. I thought that oh, was yeah, that creative. was fun. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was a really good project, and it, I I can't imagine getting to see that on a a, a network show or a cable show. No. It, that, that, that's kind of you really need to be operating in that kind of independent space in order to be able to to, to have those conversations. And I, I thought that that was terrific. And th which leads me to my my final question because I don't want to tie up too much of your time here. But what what's twenty twenty one have to offer? I don't want to you know ruin any surprises, but yeah, I, you're putting some great teasers out on Facebook about what we might be seeing on the show. And I was wondering if there's anything in particular we could look forward to as an audience. Um, well, I'm trying to set up little sets of shows. So rather than just having a scattergun and we go from, you know, one theater to another, I want to try and do little sets of shows about the same theme. Um, so for example, in February, there's going to be a Wajima week and I've got three shows lined up so far, probably a fourth. Um, and they will be complementary, but kind of also different points of view i've got one particular historian coming on 
whose book is kind of controversially been kind of, you know, um, pulled apart by the Marine Corps vets and stuff. But to me, his, his viewpoint is interesting. I don't, as the host, necessarily have to agree with everything he says, but he's done the research. He's got a point of view. There's his thing. Then the same week, I've got a guy who actually works at the US Marine Corps Museum coming on talking. Now, probably what they'll say will in some ways contradict, but it doesn't matter. People, the audience will decide what they do and don't like. And so, so that, that's what I'm trying to do. So bring some themes, guys. So I'm doing some um, music shows. So I, I, the Star Wars thing uh, you asked me about is, is what I call um, cross-pollination. It's where I try and merge audiences together from different genres. So you try and bring in the World War II guys, and you try and, in that case, bring in the Star Wars guys. So tomorrow, for example, I'm interviewing Andy McCluskey from the band OMD, big synth pop hit in 1980 with Nola Gay, the only pop song that sold 5 million copies written about an event in World War II, written about the B-29 that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Now, people say, people have said, why are you interviewing a pop star? Said, because that song has now is now cited in American classrooms, teaching about atomic history as part of the public perception of atomic program. It has become its own thing now. That song has been heard by more people than have read books about it. So it is Absolutely. interesting. Um, and and so I, I like to bring together these little genres. The comics shows I did, I really enjoyed about World War II comic writing. Um, and how that is perceived to be different. If you're writing a serious book about a battle, you're a proper historian. If you're writing a comic, you're just writing comics. Well, let me tell you, the guys who research the comics probably do as much research, go to as many archives as the guys who write the histories. But the, the comic industry is seen in one way, and, the, and I like this idea of bringing all these genres together because... You know, what you're doing with your show, what I'm doing in my show, we're reaching out and we're hitting a different kind of audience. There's an overlap. There are people who don't buy books but do spend their time on YouTube. So you've already, when you had George Lazon, for example, or Greg Way, you've already reached people who wouldn't go to a, book, a shop and buy a book. And maybe yes, that one or two of those people are now interested in something that they wouldn't have been from another, another media. So... To me, it all links up video games, comics, World War II films, TV shows, podcasts, YouTube channels, anything that encourages people to understand history has got to be a good thing. And it's about us all moving forward on a combined front rather than, you know, it's all the authors, oh, podcasts, that's for, that's for the, you know, that, no, don't look at it that way. Jo join in, you do them. Um, it's, um, it's important. No, and that's a fantastic note to go out on, Paul. And, and I really appreciate the comments you're making about comics. I loved them as a kid. I got away from them as an adult. But when you, the the one you had been talking about where they brought Sergeant Rock back and incorporated him into the story yeah. of the Lost Battalion, uh, that was obvious the level of research that went into that was on par with anything that an academic researcher would have to do. Yeah. So it's, it's just amazing the, uh, the variety of genres where this level of activity, level of research and, and standard of professionalism is taking place. And I think that's great that you're sharing that with the world. And I, I'm about out of time here. So I really want to thank you for taking time out of your evening to be on the show today, Paul. I really appreciate it. No, I'm happy. And uh, I'm happy to come back on again and talk about you know, my writing or my research, but um, that was a good starting point. I'm, I'm, I'm here anytime you just, just press the button and I'll, I'll come back on again if you want me. Uh, I would love to have you again. Don't, don't worry about that. I, I will definitely be in touch. And I, I look forward to having you back again. Hey, everybody, this has been Ben Powers on The Commander's Voice. My guest tonight has been Paul Widaj. I've learned a lot from you, Paul, just by uh, you know studying what you're doing on YouTube. I've got a lot of tonight's conversation. So again, thank you very much. No problem at all. I enjoyed it.